1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. And you will find there these words. And they're written by the Apostle Paul and he's writing to the believers in the church at Corinth. And Paul makes this declaration. Paul says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Isn't that a great verse? Isn't that a powerful passage of Scripture? Listen to it out of the, uh, my dad always liked the J.B. Phillips translation. And uh, I guess because he did, I kind of do too. Listen to how it's put. The preaching of the cross is nonsense to those who are involved in this dying world. But to us who are being saved from that death, it is nothing less than the power of God. Praise the Lord. I, uh, that's a great verse to memorize. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Much of the uh, scripture that I draw from on a daily basis in overcoming the enemy, in taking authority, in standing strong, comes from memorization when I was a boy in Sunday school and a teenager in youth groups. And I draw from it still today. This is a great verse to memorize. For the message of the cross. Come on, say it. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Praise the Lord. Let's look at this verse today, okay? For the message of the cross. For the message of the cross. There are a lot of messages that are being spewed and coming forth from the church today. And there is a world out there that has trouble deciphering, deciphering and sorting what the true message is. There are a lot of messages that are coming from the church today that have no biblical basis or authority. They have been concocted and contrived in the minds of men, and there is no scriptural basis for them. We have one message to declare. The message of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you please, the message of Celebrate Church of Northwest Arkansas in 2017 must still be the message of the cross. The Apostle Paul, he was one of the most learned men. He was a know-it-all kind of guy when it came to the Holy Scriptures. He had studied it. He knew everything there was to know about it, but he said, I want to keep it simple. I want to keep the main thing, the main thing. My message that I bring and I preach and I declare will be the message of the cross. And the message of the cross is void. It's just not in a lot of messages we hear today. It's not in a lot of songs that we hear. It is not in a lot of churches throughout the land today or sermons that are needed are declared. And I, I sat down this week and I came to this realization that if we at Celebrate Church are not continually proclaiming the message of the cross, we're missing it by a million miles, folks. We really are. The message of the cross is the only message that can change anyone. God did not plant us here as a new church to preach some message of brotherhood or social reform or how to deal with this or that. We have one message to declare, and that is the message of the cross. Amen. And if we are not proclaiming the message of the cross, we are not a New Testament church. Oh, but we speak in tongues and 
We have the gifts of the Spirit in operation, and we do all of this, and, and that's great and wonderful, and I believe in that, and I believe there's Bible for that. But you can have all of those things, and yet if we never declare the reality of the message of the cross of Jesus Christ, we missed it, folks. It must be our heartbeat. The message of the cross is what we are supposed to be all about. Real simple question. So, what is the message of the cross? Come on, you can Google it faster than that. <laughs> what is the message of the cross? Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Sacrifice. He rose again. He rose again. Eternal life. Eternal life. For our righteousness, freedom from sin, freedom from sin. Yeah. love, love. Yeah. Hey, all of that stuff sounds great and fantastic to people who out there walk into these stores and they've been beat up all week long and they have no hope. And they hear not a word of encouragement from anyone. When the message of the cross is declared, it inspires hope and it brings to a helpless person the help they need. We must declare the message of the cross. Okay? Let's read on in this verse. For the message of the cross is what? It's foolishness to those who are perishing. The message of the cross is is foolishness to those who are perishing. And the Greek word that is used here for foolishness is a word that is translated moron. <laughs> Anybody ever use that word? <laughs> the world, those who are perishing, those who mock, those who ridicule, those who make fun of the message of the cross, those who know not God are saying to you and me and to what we are doing here today. They're saying, you idiot, you dummy, you stupid moron. To, to believe in the cross, man, you're nothing but an incomplete. <laughs> you're weird. Nobody in his right mind could believe that. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Hey, we are living, church. We are living in a day and time more and more when an unbelieving world looks at folks just like you and me and they're saying that's foolishness. That's right. Yes. And we hear it even within the church, hey, that doesn't attract people. This blood stuff, this cross stuff, man, that turns them off. It's just not relevant. It doesn't fit in with our message. It's archaic. It's not with it. It's disgusting. It's nothing but foolishness. You bunch of dumb morons. Paul said that the message of the cross would be foolish to some and offensive to others. Can I tell you through the centuries of time since then, right up to today, this day in 2017, it is still thought as foolishness by a world who knows not Jesus Christ. I've mentioned before, but a modern pastor has said this, and I quote him, the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross has no more significance than the blood of a dead chicken. Oh Mahatma Gandhi, great Hindu teacher, he said this, and I quote him, his death, Jesus' death on the cross was a great example to the world but to believe anything like a mysterious and miraculous virtue in it, well, my heart could not accept it. Gandhi was saying, I'm a good guy. Jesus was a good guy. 
Jesus suffered wrongly. Hey, I suffered wrongly. Jesus is still a good example of how to suffer and injustice when it comes your direction and still maintain integrity, moral character, and fiber. But as far as him dying for me or accomplishing anything, I just don't accept that. Right here in the good old USA, did you know in the year 1892, there was a Supreme Court decision that handed down that declared this, that Jesus Christ is the Redeemer of mankind. Wow. Isn't that powerful? The Supreme Court made the declaration to our country, Jesus Christ is the Redeemer of mankind. We hear continually of terrorists and terrorism. There's a branch of terrorists operating out of Iraq. They have declared war on, and this is what they have declared a war on, the worshipers of the cross. The worshipers of the cross. And by the way, there's one thing that radical Islamists don't get right. They, they got it wrong. We don't worship the cross. We worship the man who hung upon that cross. Amen. His name is Jesus. And they went on to say, we shall break the cross and you shall have no choice, Islam or death. Now that's kind of silly. I mean, when I read that and I thought about it, because they don't understand, they don't know that even if they kill us, what happens? We're going to be with Jesus. The very reason he came and did what he did up on that cross, amen? This is something else, as I've thought about this this week in this passage of Scripture, it's real curious to me that the symbol of the cross has moved from the Christian faith into uh, the pop culture of today. And it's used many times to make fashion statement. Watch TV. Uh, don't watch the award shows. But watch TV. Notice how often the rock stars and the rappers and the actors and the actresses and the sports figures even, they have no interest in Jesus at all. But they'll wear a cross. It's a fashion statement. I always want to strike, you know, what's going on? Madonna. You ever heard of her? Madonna was on tour a few years ago now, and she called the tour Confessions. And on that tour, she grossed $193 million. At the end of each of those performances on that tour, they would bring out a large disco cross. And she would have a mock crucifixion on that disco cross. And she issued a statement, and I quote her, I believe in my heart that if Jesus were alive today, which is a weird statement because he is alive, of course. Jesus is alive. I mean, think about it. She got the cross thing down, but she should have kept reading the book. You should have seen what else is in there because it gets better. He is alive today. Amen. She said, I believe in my heart if Jesus were alive today, he would do the same thing. End of quote. Madonna was basically saying, I'm just like Jesus. Really? Uh huh? And I might point to the obvious that laying down on the disco cross and making $193 million is not exactly like my Jesus. But I stand here today to say, let them mock. Let them make fun. 
Let them laugh. Let them ridicule. Let them call us morons and fools and dumb. Let us be persecuted for the cross of Jesus Christ, which, by the way, many today, this very day, in different parts of the world are being persecuted because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Let them do all of those things and paint us weird and call us dumb and stupid, foolish. Who in their right mind could believe that Jesus died on a cross to take away sins and that it actually happens? Let all of that be said and be done our direction, but I stay in the midst of the ball. Still count me with the cross crowd. Still count me with the men and women and the young people who believe in the cross of Jesus Christ. I still believe in an old rugged cross as I stand here today and I still believe that Jesus died upon that cross for me and I believe that he died upon that cross for you. I still believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I still believe that Jesus paid it all on that old rugged cross. And I still believe what is the heart of the gospel, that God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. just want to tell you today, friend, and remind you, the reality of the cross of Jesus Christ is a game changer. It is a game changer. And yet to so many, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Look at that 18th verse again, there's more. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved. But to those of us who are being saved. Now it is a different day and I know nobody sins anymore. Nobody sins anymore. We make mistakes. We do wrong decisions and wrong choices. We are bad at our little indiscretions. But hear me, church. The truth of the matter is we're all sinners. And we're all sinners who needed a Savior. I was a five-year-old boy in Springfield, Missouri when I arrived at that point of knowing right from wrong. And I sat in a Sunday night service and I felt conviction for the sin in my life. I hadn't robbed a bank. I hadn't shot, killed, or murdered anybody. I hadn't got high on drugs. I was a five and a half year old boy that I realized the old sin nature was in me. And that God sent his son Jesus Christ that I could be free from that and become a new person, a new kid in Christ Jesus. I was a five year old boy at the age of accountability in my life and I realized I still needed a savior. I was a sinner. You say, well, but Pastor Phil, I was born a Christian. No. I was born a Christian. And I've heard that. Or well, you begin to talk about the things of the Lord, and, and I've heard about so many saintly grandmothers. Can I remind you, God doesn't have any grandchildren? <laughs> For all of sin, the Bible says. We hear a lot about the Supreme Court. The eternal Supreme Court of Heaven has already ruled on that. God has said for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Our righteousness, what's it like? It's like filthy rags. We all needed to be saved. We all need a Savior. Amen. I mean, your good works and 
all of the right stuff you do of acting and talking and looking and doing all of the right stuff will not give to you eternal life. You couldn't lift up yourself by your own bootstraps because of your righteousness and your own goodness. It just doesn't happen that way. But to those who are being saved. How many are saved here today? Hey, what? Give me four people who stand up right now. Tell me about your salvation. You're saved. Don't say that. I mean, come on. Four people. One, two, three. Four. Okay. As a young child, I became a follower of Jesus. I saw it manifested in my family's life. I saw my mother and dad live that. But just like you, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit works in a child's life just like it does in an adult's life. And he changed me as a child. I've strayed, he brought me back, I've strayed. You know, I haven't always just lived a perfect life and still don't. But that love that he showed me on the cross of Calvary still is, it's active today. And it keeps me. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I guess I was probably like, like five or something and then I just realized you can start coming back and then like what you're doing and then I just realized Only the revival meeting in the Greater St. Louis area in the church that he attended. On fire for God. Many young people in that church were there because of one guy, Stan Cox. And once he got saved, didn't think he was supposed to sit on it, but he was to share it. And he shared the love of Jesus and the message of the cross. Saved, aren't you glad you saved? But let's stand up and let's just thank God for our salvation. Okay? They let us away of testifying. But you personally lift your voice and your hands. And how do you want to come? Thank God for your salvation today. Praise the Lord. 
the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. For redeeming me. For the Rejection of the message 
as they came on the scene declaring, Thus saith the Lord, and they turned their back on it and went after the nations that sought other gods. I believe Jesus saw that, and he was moved. I believe as he hung upon that cross, he took a downward look from where Jesus was hidden. He saw the telltale marks of sin and dissipation and scorn. Here are the soldiers at the foot of the cross, and they're gambling, and they're cursing. They're gambling for his garments. I believe he looked down, and he was able to see Judas over there yonder in some forest. As he hung himself, and as his body dropped to the ground, his bowels gushed out. I believe he was able to see Peter after he had denied the Christ. As he took that downward look, he was able to see him as Peter, the word says, wept, wept bitterly. He looked down and again he sees the perspiration beads upon the brow, upon the head of a Roman centurion soldier. Who in the midst of all of this that is happening, he lifts his voice and he says, truly, this was the Son of God. Truly, this was the Son of God. Think about it. Jesus, as he looked down, hanging upon that cross, he had to see the tear-stained face and the swollen eyes of his mother at that foot of the cross. Oh, it must have touched his heart. I believe he was able, as he hung upon that cross, to look somewhere, someplace, and he saw Satan and all of the imps and the devils of hell as they begin to set up a party and they begin to rejoice in a, in a celebration thinking they had triumphed over the cross and over Jesus Christ and over the kingdom of God. But it was only momentary. I believe he was able, he was Jesus, God's son, to see those things. The word lets me know that as he hung there, he took an outward look and he looked one direction and there was a thief hanging. And this thief, like so many, was going into eternity cursing and blaspheming and having nothing to do with God. And he looked outward the other direction and here is another thief, but this one saying, have mercy on me. I want to go to heaven. And that had to move the heart of Jesus in recognizing what he was doing was the payment once and for all, for all lost sinful mankind. I believe as he hung up on that cross, Jesus took an outward look and he looked into the heavens. And I believe he saw angels with their heads bowed, weeping because of what was happening on that cross. I believe he saw some of those angels petitioning and asking, Father God, just let me go. Hey, let me go and free him from that cross. Let me go. From my understanding of reading the scriptures, I have to believe the saddest sight that Jesus saw as he hung upon that cross that day was when he looked toward the heavens. And he looked past the angels and he looked beyond there and he saw his father. And because of what was happening upon that old rugged cross, it was so horrific, God the Father, the Son of Jesus Christ, turned his head from the horrificness of that sea. I believe as he hung up on that cross, Jesus also took a forward look. And I believe through his might and power, he was able to look through the telescope of time and down through the centuries, and he sees a great army of the Lord on the move. They're going forward, they're going on in spite of persecutions, in spite of threats, in spite of whippings, in spite of jail sentences, and they're going forward to set the world on fire, and the devil can't do anything about it. He sees people who will pray, who will fast, who will wrestle until the answer comes. He sees men and women, people like you and I, who will not be satisfied with watered-down services and religious routines. He sees 
been anointed people who wait and who will carry before the throne of God. He hears them as they shout and as they pray and as they intercede until teeming millions, I believe this church, fall from the clutch of the hand of the enemy into the kingdom of righteousness. I believe Jesus watched spiritual giants as they refused to be stopped or turned aside by scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites and all kinds of malicious persecution until the gospel circled this old world, this globe. I believe he saw all of that. He was God manifest in the flesh. I believe he saw all of that. But I believe, friend, the greatest sight that Jesus saw as he hung upon that cross. But again, he looked down through the telescope of time and he saw you. And you, and you, and you, and you. And he saw you in your hopelessness. And in your helplessness. And he saw you hunger and he sent somebody along to tell you the good news. And he saw you as you turned to him in your tears of repentance. He saw you when you were transformed from darkness into light. And I believe he looked and he saw with that happening in your life and in millions upon millions of others, he saw hell being thrown into a panic and heaven, if you please, into a picnic, a celebration. A time of rejoicing. Because that's what happens when somebody is saved. Like those have testified this morning. There is great rejoicing in heaven. Do you think they said heaven? No. Just another one. Well, that's 38 million points. Oh, they get happy. I've seen how well many people in churches, people who serve as de deacons, tell people when they got up from an altar, came as a sinner, prayed a prayer, got up, and I've heard them say things like this, you're not going to make it. I give you two months. While we're doing all of that kind of crud, I almost said another word, while we're doing all that kind of crud, Heaven's rejoicing. Because the message of the cross is the power of God. It's the only thing that can change Northwest Arkansas. It's the only thing that can change men and women and young people who live here. It is the message of the cross. And out of all he saw when he saw you, I personally believe that's when he cried, it's finished. And he gave his life that you might have eternal life. Amen. How many of you received that eternal life? Show him it. It's just, it's like, 